Hello, students, and welcome back to History of Public Health. The last couple weeks in class, we've been dealing with some introductory matters. We've talked about the importance of history as a tool for understanding and improving public health. We've also gotten into some historiographical matters and have a good sense of how the scholarship on the history of public health has changed over the last few decades. As a result of our discussions, we've all realized that taking an historical approach to public health means placing it in the context of broader developments and seeing how it both shapes and is shaped by political, economic, social, cultural, and ideological factors. We've learned that in order to understand public health, we need to examine it in connection with things like the rise of the modern state, the political interactions of governments and citizens, and questions of power, authority, and control. On a practical level, what this means is that public health has not always been guided purely by health-related concerns. There is nothing natural or inevitable about public health. Far from being an automatic response to the spread of infectious disease, initiatives to protect the health of populations have historically been contingent on a whole host of other things. Things like theories of health and illness, ideas about the role of the state, the presence or absence of professional and philanthropic organizations, and local contexts. As an illustration of that point, in this lecture, I'd like to take us to a time before public health. At first glance, it might seem strange to think that there was such a time, because as we know, illness and infectious disease are almost as old as the human species itself. But, according to historians, the story of public health is one that began only in the early modern period, specifically as a reaction to the bubonic plague and syphilis outbreaks of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. Prior to this, there was no public health. In some of the world's earliest civilizations, including those of the ancient Mediterranean, the idea that the state should be responsible for the well-being of the population was completely anathema, as was the notion that political authorities should undertake measures designed to slow the spread of epidemics. It appears something other than the presence of mass illness was required to stimulate the development of public health. So why was this? Why didn't pre-modern societies in places like Greece and Rome have public health? What prevented the emergence of this, and what does this tell us about the relationship between public health, society, and the state? In what follows, I'd like to get into these questions, which will set us up nicely for our next class, where we'll talk about the birth of public health during the era of the Black Death. If the ancient Greeks lacked a concept of public health, it was not because epidemics were entirely unknown to pre-modern peoples. During our species' formative years, humans survived by hunting and gathering, moving from one place to another with the changing seasons and existing in quite low numbers. Because small numbers of hunter-gatherers could not support acute epidemic diseases, most of the ailments of prehistoric people were mild and limited to scattered individuals here and there. But with the beginnings of agriculture between 12 and 15,000 years ago, this equilibrium was disrupted. Because agriculture created a surplus of food, human numbers began to increase and more and more people began to live in settled locations, first in rural communities, and then in cities. In settling down, our species supported the spread of intestinal parasitic infections, which came about from the contamination of water supplies owing to the large quantities of human waste we began producing. In addition to this, the domestication of animal species brought us into much closer contact with poultry, dogs, cattle, mice, rats, pigs, horses, sheep, cats, and goats, all of which suffered from their own diseases. 
With the passage of time, many of these diseases jumped from animal to human form. In fact, we know that about 250 of the human diseases suffer, we suffer today originally affected only animals. Once these could infect humans, these zoonotic diseases began to spread through the increasingly dense cities that farmers dwelt in, moving from person to person and in the process creating the world's first epidemics. For evidence of this among the ancient Greeks, we need look no further than the first book of Homer's epic poem, The Iliad. Homer opens this story with a plague that brings nine days of death to the Greeks, and the origin of this fatal epidemic is the god Apollo. An agent of destruction, Apollo visits this evil illness upon them uh, on account of their refusal to return his daughter, who has been captured by Agamemnon. I'll allow you to read the passage that describes the epidemic here on the screen for yourself. As that passage reveals, because of its divine origin, the Greeks placed their hopes not in a physician, but instead in someone skilled in understanding the gods. Only when returning the abducted girl to him and offering up a sacrifice does Apollo relent, bringing an end to the deadly plague. This is one of the reasons the ancient Greeks lacked public health. Those diseases that infected masses of people, as opposed to stray individuals, were sometimes thought to have a supernatural origin, which meant that preventing their spread required an appeal to the gods. Similar tendencies can be seen in Greek reactions to an actual historical epidemic, the Great Plague of Athens, which struck the city in 430 BC. This epidemic, which may have been caused by smallpox, struck at a time when pneumonia, tuberculosis, polio, dysentery, diphtheria, malaria, and other communicable diseases were beginning to make inroads into much of Eurasia for the first time. It began during the Peloponnesian Wars and was chronicled by Thucydides, the historian who described it as such. And again, I'll let you read this on your own. The epidemic lasted two to three years. It claimed the lives of one quarter of the Athenian army and countless civilians. Historians estimate that the disease reduced Athens' population by about 75,000. As Thucydides' testimony indicates, in response to it, Athenians sought the aid of deities, specifically Asclepius. Before becoming the chief healing god of Greco-Roman antiquity, Asclepius was a mortal. He was the so-called blameless physician who was slain by Zeus for having brought the dead back to life. His cult first attracted a following in the Peloponnese Islands during the 6th century, but by 420 BC or so, it had spread to Athens, no doubt partially as a result of the plague of Athens. As Asclepius' followers multiplied, hundreds of temples and shrines to him were built throughout the Mediterranean world, and men and women visited these when seeking healing that physicians could not provide. After arriving at these sanctuaries, pilgrims would undergo a rite of bathing for purification, as ritual purity was one of the prerequisites for approaching a god. After this, the supplicant offered sacrifices, cakes, fruits, perhaps a pig, and read testimonials written on marble tablets in the sanctuary, which told of instances of miraculous healing. If the communal response to the plague of Athens revolved around prayers to Asclepius, it should be noted that the city's political leaders made no attempts to stop this epidemic. Neither did ancient Greek healers like Hippocrates or any of his followers agitate for a governmental response to the disease, and this was as true of the plague of Athens as it was with any of the other maladies that afflicted the ancient Greeks. Why was this? Why wasn't public health to be found within this civilization? For one, it should be noted that, based on everything we know, 
major epidemics appear to have been incredibly rare here. Compared to the world of the 21st century, that of ancient Greece was relatively small. Most cities were no larger than 3,000 inhabitants, and most people lived in small villages. There was also far less mobility than people have today. Most communities were self-sufficient, and they adopted a number of different methods for coping with seasonal fluctuations in soil fertility and rainfall. However, while one bad harvest could be overcome, a series of deficient farming seasons could lead to death and disaster. Indeed, the Greek word for dearth, limos, as in a dearth of food, was very similar to the word loimos, which meant widespread disease. The similarities between limos and loimos speak to the realities of a world in which the line between having enough to feed one's family and desperately searching for anything to eat was incredibly thin. As such, whether in town or countryside, malnutrition and famines were a major factor in the general demographic outline of ancient Greece. Yet, while famine and malnutrition were fairly common, the scattered, spread out, largely immobile nature of the Greek population protected most from outbreaks of epidemic disease, instances like the Plague of Athens notwithstanding. It is in part on account of this that ancient Greeks cared little for public health. So too did views of illness play into this state of affairs. In the ancient Mediterranean, there wasn't much of a concept of contagion. To be sure, there was a belief that proximity to the sick could lead to illness. We can see this awareness in the writings of Thucydides, who elsewhere in his writings about the plague of Athens noted how, quote, the doctors were themselves most likely to die inasmuch as they were the most faithful attendants of the sick. Continuing on, he wrote of how people became filled with disease through attending on one another. From Thucydides' statements, it might seem clear to us that the ancient Greeks had a concept of contagion similar to our own, but such a conclusion would be erroneous. For one, Thucydides neither specifies exactly how contact with the sick spreads illness, nor suggests that contagion is the major way that the plague of Athens spread. Ancient theories of contagion are not theories involving things like germs and viruses. Clearly, the way contagion gets talked about in ancient sources is very different from the way we would use it today. That's because the peoples of antiquity saw disease as something that affected an individual and had its origins in an individual's own physical makeup as affected by his or her lifestyle. For example, while bad air might be cited as a cause of an epidemic, almost all Greek medical writers explained illness in terms of people's interaction with the environment. What mattered was diet and lifestyle and how they strengthened or weakened resistance to things like bad air. And because Greek medicine was so individualistic, the idea that certain groups of symptoms could be spoken of as diseases that affected people regardless of their own physical constitutions was unknown. Instead, most disease was understood to be a result of internal imbalances within the body, that is to say, of disordered humors. In ancient Greece, sicknesses were often named after the humoral imbalances thought to cause them. For example, Conditions like jaundice and diarrhea were referred to as choleric conditions because they were due to an excess of yellow bile. Melancholia, by contrast, was thought to be caused by too much black bile. Seasonal and meteorological factors certainly mattered, but their impact depended on how hardy and how healthy the body's internal system was. The only identified environmental causes of disease in the ancient Greco-Roman world were miasmas. Miasmas were poisonous airs that could weaken the body and disrupt its functioning. One might call this contagion, but it's quite different from our modern ideas. So, as all of this goes to show, there was a time before public health. And this fact leads us to some interesting questions, which I'm very excited to see you respond to. Until then, 
Bye-bye for now. Take care.